I'm joined today by Ryan Morrison, who's a video game attorney. Ryan, uh, you have been working on so many of the issues that have been sort of plaguing and affecting programs like ours for so long, including those of uh, 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 fraudulent and incorrect copyright claims, fair use, and so many of these other areas. So let's start sort of at the broadest place and, and start narrowing down. When we talk about fair use and the idea of one program or YouTube channel or media outlet using a piece of someone else's content, be it from another news channel or from a sporting event like the NFL or from a local news station, what are the sort of general rules that dictate whether you are legally entitled to use that footage? Sure. So first and foremost, I wouldn't touch anything from the NFL. They're very litigious and they'll come after you. Uh, as a general rule, though, base, fair use is, is not a right. It's not what everyone thinks it is on the Internet. Fair use is a defense, meaning you've already infringed, you're in a courtroom, and now you have to prove that what you used was okay to use, even though it was infringing. It was a fair use, if you will. But nothing is fair use until a judge says it is. And to get a judge to say it is will cost you almost certainly a minimum of six figures, oftentimes a lot more. It's, it's not something that really exists on the smaller independent game developer side of things or the smaller YouTube channels or anything like that. Uh, it does, of course, exist in a technical sense, but it's incredibly difficult to actually utilize or, or you know, uh, rely on. What fair use generally is through, through you know, history was being used for journalism or uh, some kind of educational use or for a review or parody. Parody is not exactly fair use, but it's very similar. It's, it's, uh, it's a four-factor test where basically you prove uh, that it, it, what you're using is not hurting the original owner. So it, it's not automatically fair use if you're, what you're doing is free, but it helps your argument that it's fair use if, you're, if what you're doing is free. It's not automatically fair use if you use under 15 seconds of the clip but it helps your argument and, and it goes down the line like that. Uh, but it's certainly not the right everyone thinks it is and it's certainly not something that's automatic. YouTube or, or, or whoever else doesn't get to say this is fair use and this isn't. It's not up to them. One of the biggest sort of controversies over the system on YouTube for filing copyright infringement claims is that historically when the claimant files a claim against someone using their content, it's sort of defaulted or the the assumption immediately is that this was indeed a uh, an infringement of copyright. And then, as you mentioned, the person using the footage in question has to defend their use. Now, whether they want to sort of colloquially argue fair use, although certainly not in a courtroom, but just in a sort of counterclaim on YouTube or whether they want to argue for some other reason that they were OK to have used that video, the, the default is the claimant is right that they were infringed upon. Is that logical? Is that mirrored elsewhere in legal proceedings? Well, it's, it's, it's the law right now, so that doesn't, that's oftentimes not the logical answer, it's the legal answer. But basically, technology has grown way too quickly for our legislators to keep up with. Uh, unfortunately, we have a group of people writing the laws who don't understand any of the technology they're writing about. And in what was kind of a miraculous event, they made the DMCA safe harbor provision. What that is, is they looked at YouTube and they said, all right, YouTube gets about seven days, seven days of footage uploaded every hour. So they can't possibly go through all that themselves. They can't police themselves. But YouTube's also not creating any of their own stuff. So instead of making YouTube liable for everything on its website, like they would be in a traditional sense, we'll make it that the IP holder who's being infringed can tell YouTube about the infringement, and if YouTube takes it down immediately, they're no longer liable. If YouTube leaves it up or has some kind of appeal process first or has a conversation first, they're all of a sudden now liable too. So for example, if I upload Star Wars to YouTube, Disney would normally be able to sue me and YouTube. Now Disney tells YouTube I uploaded it, they, YouTube takes it down, they're safe, and Disney can only sue me. Uh, the way it works is, is then if it was a fair use parody video or something like that, I could argue after the fact and try to get my video reinstated. But again, it's more of a let's work something out type of deal as opposed to actual law at that point. OK, when we talk about sort of the, the most litigious entities when it comes to the use of content, you mentioned the NFL. We for years have never even 
we don't even think about considering a negotiation internally about whether to use NFL content because they are just, as you mentioned, so litigious. In my experience, local news stations are very, very litigious and aggressive when it comes to uh, alleged copyright infringement. National news channels like CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, rarely ever a problem. What other sorts of entities in, in your experience are the ones where you really shouldn't even get involved using their content? I mean, movie studios also. It's uh, there's a lot of review channels on YouTube where they're looking at a movie and then they're shocked that you know Fox sends them a takedown. Uh, that's just it, it's not even necessarily the wrong thing. I mean, if I I understand that when you when you own your IP, you want to control it, and that's what IP exists for, intellectual property. So that's why that's there. That's why copyright exists. You put all this hard work and effort into a video, someone else just steals it, puts it on their channel, and steals all your revenue. So. There is. It's not like it's all evil. The flip side is, you know, you look at the NFL versus the NBA. The NBA lets their footage all over social media, all over everywhere. They encourage it. They think it builds the fan base. It builds excitement. The NFL, on the other hand, historically has issue takedowns pretty quickly. So there is just different mentalities to this stuff. And within the law, they're all OK. Within, uh, you know, your opinion of intellectual property might change pretty heavily depending on which one you're looking at. But in terms of uh, the DMCA and, and YouTube, that's really just there to protect YouTube. And it's impossible for YouTube to turn around and say, hey, we want to, we're going to look at fair use first. We're going to review all these takedowns first. They, they just actually can't do that. As a sort of general practice for small producers of content, what do they need to do in order to be able to prevent their content from being copied or used inappropriately. In other words, if uh, you know you make a program, uh, Ryan Morrison, whatever, where you talk about these types of issues and you create a YouTube channel and a podcast, do you need to trademark, for example, the name of that? Or do you need to be uh, how, how uh, proactive do you need to be to be able to protect yourself if someone else just downloads and re-uploads your content? Sure. So trademark and copyright are different here. So the DMCA is, is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So it's only copyright. Trademark, on the other hand, protects your brand. It's your it's your channel name. It's your logo. The copyright is all your actual videos, all your actual assets in there. So that that's the difference between those two. And it's a big difference in terms of the law, because with the copyright, you have to take it down immediately. With the trademark, you need to actually have that conversation first and prove that it is a trademark infringement to YouTube and things like that. Uh, in terms of what you have to do early, copyright and trademark both have common law protection. A copyright is basically automatically registered when you create something. If I squiggle something on a chalkboard, I have a copyright on that. A registered copyright, where you actually go through the, the US office and fully register it, allows you to sue over it. To issue a DMCA takedown, it doesn't need to be registered. So the poorest creator in the world, if he gets ripped off, can issue a DMCA takedown. Be careful with that, because if you issue one that's not right, especially against a bigger company, if your takedown is frivolous, you've committed perjury and you've committed a crime. So you have to be careful what you're issuing takedowns on. With the trademark, on the other hand, I, I'm a big believer in registering that right away. So if you come up with a channel name you really like or, or a, a podcast name you really like, Trademark it immediately and make sure it's yours. Otherwise, you'll not be able to protect it. When you talk about um, uh, registering it, what's the process uh, uh, where, whereby that's done? How long does it take? Is it the type of thing that people are advised to work with an attorney? I mean, I know people who have registered uh, uh, trademarks on their own, and it's actually turned out to be a total disaster. But maybe that was just the particular experience of that one individual. Yeah, so the. The big difference here, again, is copyrights are very simple to get. Copyrights, you go to the website, you put in the application, there's not really a review process, and boom, you have a copyright. Trademarks, on the other hand, are very difficult to get. They take six months to two years. You have to argue with an examiner in most cases, and it's really something you should have an attorney do. I, I, I don't want to uh, be accused of defamation or anything, but the last time I checked, and I encourage you to check these facts, Something like a legal zoom only has a 13% success rate, while most law firms have a success rate over 80%. So it's a big gap there. And the reason is, is, is when you're defining your class of goods or your description of your item, uh, just lawyers know what they're doing better there. And the examiners at the, the trademark office are more willing to talk to an attorney most times. So it, it, it's worth the extra money to use an attorney because you, you don't have to do it three times then. 
do you get the sense, generally speaking, that uh, law is eventually going to catch up to sort of how the Internet actually works? I mean, I'm reminded of this incredible case from New York State where uh, somebody who had been uh, watching child porn was not actually legally liable because by the definition of the law, they hadn't downloaded it in the sense that they didn't right click and save the images to their hard drive. It was a disaster that law was uh, ultimately changed to actually account for how the Internet is used. Do you see these types of issues being resolved or do you see a, a long period where usage is going to be well ahead of where the law is? I mean, not to get political, but I think it's not going to matter in a couple of years when we don't have an Internet anymore from Donald Trump. So <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I mean, when we keep electing people who think the earth is 5000 years old, right? We're 6, not gonna get, Come on, let's give them credit. Sorry. But really, we're not going to get laws that fix te technology then. I mean, we have people on on the, the science committee that don't believe in science. Uh, you know, whatever you believe is, is beautiful. And I encourage you to have your faith and all your different ideas. But if you want to write laws about computers, you should believe that computers exist and the Internet's a thing, unlike most of our legislators. So, no, I don't have any hope that in the near future this stuff's going to be fixed. So for you, it was a real red flag when Lindsey Graham, who's on a technology subcommittee, said he had never sent an email in his life. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> and then you look at the judges. I mean, honestly, how many judges do you think are operating their own email? I'm, I'm very friendly with a lot of law clerks who work for judges. And I can tell you the answer is not a lot. Uh, it's it's very scary and it's unfortunate because technology has grown faster than it ever has in human history. And, you know, our legislative and political process is a lot slower than that. So we'll we'll see. I mean, I ultimately I would love to see a separate Supreme Court for techno, uh, technology issues, maybe even an international court for it that's binding in, in jurisdictions, something like a burn convention in, in intellectual property. Here, I mean, when we make a terms of service for a video game, for example, we're, we're bound to, you know, 500 different jurisdictions. That's that's not how it should be. You shouldn't upload an app and all of a sudden be liable in Africa. You know, it's just that until we have some kind of court looking at the reality of the Internet, it's a dangerous place to be doing anything. And unfortunately, it's a crapshoot who's the one that pays for it legally. Yeah. I don't know. I, I trust Clarence Thomas completely with all super advanced technology related legal issues. I don't know about you. Uh, we've been Perfect. speaking with Ryan Morrison. Check him out at RyanMorrisonLaw.com, video game attorney. Thanks for talking to us, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here.